Welcome to Liberty in America, Past, Present, and Future with Dr. Bill Joby. Doc is a historian and a reenactor. On this show, you'll hear his thoughts about our personal liberties from their earliest recorded beginnings. You'll also be transported back to the 1750s to relive the life of Colonel George Washington and his adventures during the French and Indian War. Let's get started. Here's Dr. Bill Joby. Hello again, everyone. Dr. Bill Chovey here. We're talking about liberty in America, past, present, and future. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion we've had. Uh, we are now in uh, the phase we call uh, Liberty Lights, which is expounds on uh, contemporary liberty challenges, uh, uh, building on the foundation of discussions that we've had for the first uh, several weeks of this uh, series. I had... Um, what I've been trying to do is to isolate certain liberties and put them all together for a, a singular sort of clarifying discussion. For example, to get all the the issues, the contemporary uh, problems with parents and objecting to material in schools. I wanted to spend a whole time on that, as well as others. But uh, with what's happened with the indictment of uh, the President Trump, it seems to be that it's important that we have some clarity about uh, how that all works and what kind of the major issues are that are involved here. Um, it's it's quite certain that um, he has been mistreated. Uh, he, uh, in the past, has cooperated with these people, and to say that uh, he should be treated differently than, say, Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton or, or former Vice President Pence or uh, Barack Obama or even George Bush it's just um, it's just wrong because the, what it says is that we have a double standard of justice, and when you have a double standard, you don't have a standard at all. It's unfortunate that we've come to the point where the Department of Justice and the FBI have become so weaponized, opposing uh, any effort to rein in the uh, the Leviathan bureaucracy and the powers to be that run this country. We've as previously described the um, it's a, a small group of people who have uh, taken over the bureaucracy and, and the bureaucrats, as we well know, are very secure in their jobs. It's very difficult to do anything to them. And history has shown that if you happen to be in the right party, then uh, you can get a golden parachute if you ask to leave. But uh, this is a, a massive problem of trust. What it really gets down to in dealing with issues of public trust is that I believe that this uh, these allegations against Donald Trump, given that he's had it to uh, confront these things for the past six, seven years, the final verdict is going to come from the public itself and particularly the voters. And I, my gut feeling is that he's going to survive this and be reelected. Remember, when might is right, we live in bondage. When right is might, we live in freedom. Well, this what's been happening, particularly since to be particularly obvious since COVID, was that uh, what we had thought was right to be might has become might over us. Might is right, or we are in bondage. COVID proved that rather clearly. When you have, uh, and I discussed some of this on the last visit, uh, when you have. Uh, the federal government or state and local government telling people that they can't go to church, but they can go and, and uh, protest with the BLM and Antifa and destroy property. But that's okay because they're expressing their opposition or their protest. You can see where the target is now becoming by these people in the in their um, their power drunken state. Uh, it's, it's my belief that they are at a point where either they win or they're they're gone uh, and serious charges would follow if the conservatives and other presidents returned to office and power this is life or death for these politicians and for these bureaucrats they are in way in over their heads and they're they're fighting uh, uh, like crazy to save their own hides so why do I say that? How can I say that? Well, remember we had discussions about the Constitution, and uh, several of them are applied in this particular case 
with uh, Mr. Trump. The Fourth Amendment uh, specifically uh, prohibits what's called general warrants. And this is when you're a warrant to um, seize property or to search a house or something like that. A general warrant is basically an unrestricted search warrant. You're supposed to have, the way it's supposed to be done is that uh, you go to a judge and you say, look here, we think that this person has this in their possession and we need to get a, a warrant signed to go in and look for it. So a very specific thing uh, for a specific person for a specific purpose. A general warrant uh, doesn't have any kind of specificity to it. And it's a blank check or, or if you will, carte blanche to go and look for whatever you want. And if you find something that you think looks suspicious, you can create it and, and take it into a, a criminal charge. So that's what's one of the big things that's wrong with what happened with the raid on Mar-a-Lago. The president's Fourth Amendment rights were violated. Now, another one later on, we see the Fifth Amendment uh, guarantees of due process were also violated. You know, this original grand jury that, that came out of Washington, D.C., uh, they had the uh, uh, option or they had the, the, the uh, presence of uh, people to give testimony before them. The Miami grand jury just took all the paperwork from the, the D.C. grand jury and without the ability to watch the uh, people, the witnesses that were testifying, their body language, their tone of voice, their eye contact. These are things that are important to discern whether somebody is telling the truth or not. And that grand jury in Miami was deprived of that. So that's tainted in that regard. Because due process means that you have a fair crack at, at uh, addressing charges against you. You have a fair uh, shake at... Uh, how these these uh, proceedings go against you so that when it's all said and done, the evidence stands on its own and a, a fair and just decision can be made. But if you violate that due process, that that uh, proper process, I should say, uh, then it, it taints the whole, anything that follows. And it's, it's really that kind of stuff is grounds for uh, appeal and appeals that could take years. And usually this kind of stuff ends up before the Supreme Court years from now, long after the next election. So I, I, I wonder, um, I can't help but wonder, I should say, that the, the reason this whole thing has transpired is to keep Donald Trump on the front page and on the defensive and, of course, keep Joe Biden in the basement where nobody will ever ask questions about the $5 million that he received from the Ukrainian uh, uh, Burisma executive, or nobody will say anything about how he used uh, one billion dollars of our tax dollars to uh, get the prosecutor in Ukraine off of his son's back. That's a crime. These are crimes, serious crimes, high crimes and misdemeanors. Joe Biden could be impeached and even criminally charged for some of these things as the, uh, the investigations continue into where all this money went. Now, some people say it could be as high as thirty million dollars. So it's just a matter of time before the, that money's tracked down. It was it was most telling the other day when Joe Biden was asked about this, and he says, where's the money? Oh, I was just kidding. Yeah, Joe, where's the money? And I think that's just a, a you know flashing red light. This is where you got to look. And when you find out where the money is, Joe's cooked. So they're doing everything they can to keep Joe off the front page. But some of the, the questions about uh, in, in the Trump thing are about the Espionage Act, the Espionage Act. Which basically says giving secrets to the enemy. It goes back to, to oh my gosh, 1917, and um, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was a racist and he he hated certain people, and he used the Espionage Act to get rid of a lot of his enemies, up to several thousand of them. But basically, it says if you give an enemy information that can be harmful to uh, the interests of the United States, particularly in war, that it's a crime. So this is what's being thrown at uh, President uh, Trump. Um, part of the problem with this whole thing, even though they have a tape recording, I mean, there's questions that can be raised about whether or not that tape recording was admiss admissible. There was, was he aware there was a recording going on? And just because it's an audio tape recording and it says that he was going to show some papers, did he actually show the papers? 
And if everything happened with that, uh, if he did show the papers and maybe somebody walked out with it and went over to the Iranians or some Russians or something and said, here, look at this, you know, it would help them plan against uh, the interests of the United States. So then you got something to go on. But from based upon a tape recording, who can say that he actually saw those papers? And if he did, maybe he was just waving it in front of these people. So there's some really, really uh, uh, big questions that come out of what they're using as the centerpiece of these Espionage Act. But I say this is the DOJ. Of course, the Presidential uh, Records Act gives the president sole ex exclusive control over those uh, records. And um, it's unfortunate that it's come to this because we know that uh, others have greatly abused these these uh, privileges of the presidency, uh, and most particularly of Barack Obama, who now wants over $3 million to return his records to the National Archives. So go figure. We all know how Hillary was treated. She had four investigations going against her that were dismissed uh, because, uh, remember, the FBI director, Comey, said that no reasonable prosecutor would follow up. This is just negligence. This is just sloppiness. Uh, but yet they won't hold that standard to Mr. Trump because he was a little sloppy. I'm not saying he didn't. Maybe he did do these things. But the, the, uh, looking at the the big picture of things, it's trivial. This is trivial. But for people who want to block him from ever becoming president again, it's a nuke. It's they're they're hoping that all these troubles will keep him from being reelected because they know if he's reelected, they're toast. Now, is this the first time we've ever had something like this? Well, I've seen this before. I lived through something like this back in the early 80s when I had um, I lived in a town where there was Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where right after a, a devastating flood in 1977, the economy went from one of the wealthiest communities based upon coal and steel to overnight to one of the poorest. Uh, we had 26% unemployment and it was, it was crazy. Uh, people turned against each other. Uh, money was a mess. Uh, people were out of jobs. They were making all kinds of promises by unemployment and federal grants and all these sorts of things, but it was a mess. And I just had been uh, come back from my residency in New York and I was just uh, ready to go. I was on fire. I wanted to get a, uh, a family going. I wanted to get my practice going. I had a lot of extra skills that, that I'd learned. I wanted to apply. And I didn't realize how much of a threat that I was to the status quo, the swamp, if you will. And in my case, it was the dentists, the swamp of the dentists who had been you know, living uh, there fairly well. And they were eating really well. It, it nice, uh, nice. Uh, offices and they were making good money and they just didn't want anybody coming in to potentially take even the smallest piece of that even though when they started out they had a lot of uh, a lot of other people giving them you know hand up and starting them out and being nice to them they turned on me in a vicious way they decided they want to get rid of me and they come up with charges i'd been well before all that i was falsely accused of malpractice and i uh had to uh, deal with people that were saying horrible lies about me in order to try to scare my patients away. And uh, people that were other professionals who were encouraging people to sue me for something that was nothing wasn't wrong. But when it came down to, I, I kept being able to survive their attacks. And finally they figured, well, we've got to find something to get rid of this guy. So they found a little advertisement in the yellow pages of the telephone directory. And I may have mentioned before that I have a DMD, dental medicine doctor degree. And they said, well, you're listed among medical doctors and therefore you're pretending to be a medical doctor. And I said, well, that's not true. I mean, it is what it is. That didn't matter. I was run before a kangaroo court of, of dentists who were appointed by governors, the governors, several governors over time. Uh, the prosecutor himself, I knew that advertising was permissible after the recent uh, uh, decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Bates versus Arizona State Bar, where they said uh, professionals can advertise. It's a, a form of free speech. And I was totally uh, uh, 
legitimately you know, able to do what I did. And But the ad itself, because of where it was located, which was uh, proposed by the salesman, he's the one that said, put it there, uh, that didn't matter. And when I went to this uh, hearing, I, I couldn't quite understand what their problem was until during the course of the hearing, you find that this is really not what they want. It's that they didn't like me. So it came down to finding me uh, uh, after three months and with hashing and rehashing before they met, they met once a month, hashing and rehashing the, quote, evidence by people who were not even at the hearing, they decided to issue a reprimand to me. And because it had to do with advertising that all the professional uh, organizations hated, they smeared me all over the state. And within three months, uh, my business had to close. They wanted to get me, and they did. I went to go and file an appeal to a real court because I knew I was right. I even told the board, you can't be the prosecutor, judge, and the jury. Didn't matter. Went to go before a real board, and my attorney dropped the ball on a timely basis. And I was stuck with this reprimand. It cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars. <clears throat> and that's really how I got into the idea of government. But the um, my attorney, when I questioned him about it, he says, well, oh, we had a Christmas party and I forgot about it. And I said, you know what? It took me a while to finally realize that he was part of this process. He sold me out. So they did get rid of me temporarily. <laughs> As I went back to school and got a master's degree in, in government, public administration. And when you hear about me talking about bureaucracies, it's because I've been trained by one of the, the finest schools of public administration in the country. And my one professor was the finest professor, PhD, John Rohr, um, who was a former Jesuit priest, uh, became a professor at Virginia Tech. And he was just he was just excellent. When he would start to talk about uh, uh, different uh, uh, issues and such, it would be like standing in a stiff wind. because he It was just so profound, every word that he had that came out of his mouth. That kind of guy. Those are the people that I learned under. And so I knew a lot about public administration. But it just goes to show that this whole business of using uh, the courts and the, the prosecution to get rid of people you don't like is not just limited to President Trump. Let me give you another example. This is probably more glaring or more, more exciting than the one about me. Back in Johnstown, we had a judge, uh, and I knew this man, Judge Okiki. He was um, not well-liked, but he became president judge. I worked in this campaign when I was in college when we had to do, uh, for a political science course, we had to go work on a campaign. So I, I worked with Joe for a while. Not that we were buddies or anything, but I, you know, I, I helped him as part of my coursework. But there was, after that flood in Johnstown, 77, there was a terrible liability, tremendous liability, on the people who were supposed to be managing the dam that broke. And they were supposed to have insurance to cover the damages. There were over 70 people were killed. Some were never found when the dam broke. It just washed everything away. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property destroyed. So you would think that the company that was responsible for managing the safety of the dam would have enough insurance to pay the bills. Well, they didn't. They only had like 150000 But knowing one of the members of the, the authority, I uh, got the inside scoop was that they were underinsured and... The people that were writing the policies were politically connected, and they were a powerful Republican family in, in the town. So when this judge came to uh, to where he was going to be president judge, they realized that he wanted to adjudicate all these cases, all these lawsuits against this authority that had the municipal authority, which supposedly uh, took care of the dam. And they had been warned prior to that that there was problems with this dam. So, I mean, they were dead in a rag. Or dead, they were dead guilty. There was no question about it. And they knew it. So instead of um, trying to work their way through and to compensate the people who lost their property and their homes, they decided to stall. And whenever the judge came along, and this is going on 13, 14 years, nothing's going on, he wanted to settle these cases and all of a sudden, he's under scrutiny by the attorney general. At that time in Pennsylvania, his name was Ernie Preate. 
And when he would come to Johnstown, he would stay at the home of the people who were supposedly insuring the dam. So there's all kinds of collusion going on. Well, they went after this judge for like 71 uh, potential criminal counts. Most of it was like what they're doing with Trump. And he knew that because of the people that he put away for violent acts and murder and stuff like that, that if he ever went to prison, he's a goner. They'd kill him. And he told me this. And uh, I said, well, what are you going to do? And, and fortunately, he had a passport that uh, he used to get out of the country and go to a European country of his, uh, of his family's origin in order to escape these people. The media was used just as they are with Trump. Newspapers, six o'clock news on TV, all that controlled by the same people. They just bashed this guy and bashed this guy. They did not want him around. And yet what they were accusing him of was just stupid stuff like it is with Trump. Well, he was fortunate enough to be able to get out of town and get out of their grip. Or maybe they let him go, but they just wanted him out of there. Because had he gotten into those cases, the whole world would have known that the people who were responsible for ensuring that dam were taking care of that dam were grossly negligent, and there should have been criminal charges against those people. So later on, I found out that by this member of this authority, who was honest enough to talk to me, that after all of that happened, that they became insured with Lloyds of London for m many millions of dollars. You see, this is how it works. We have a Department of Justice, not just in, in Washington, but in Johnstown, in Pennsylvania, that uses their power to protect themselves, even though it's dead wrong. Well, sounds horrible, but you know what? Eventually, God gets them. What happened with Mr. Preate, the Attorney General of Pennsylvania? He was charged with something else because he was he had to be a bad guy to do what he's doing. Eventually, he caught up with him, and he went to prison. And his task in prison was to clean out the commodes. <laughs> yeah, I gotta tell you, he was done. He lost his law license. He was done. In my particular case, uh, there were some pretty, pretty nasty things happened to people that I had nothing to do with, except to you know, exercise my rights. Uh, but whenever they, this happened to me, I, I eventually, after I got my master's, I came back and I harassed the heck out of these guys. And uh, I ran for Congress in doing so. I had some form of protection. But the bottom line is that, you know, when you do evil unto others, it comes back to you. And particularly if you're honest and you're, and you, you know, you're a, a person of faith and principle, you know, God gets them. Believe me, God gets them. So you can't walk around being bitter. But it's sad. I expect to see some horrible things come down on, on Biden and his families. Not to say that somebody's going to go out and get him, but he has so much out there that, that so many, uh, for better terms, sins that he has built up over time. And at some point in time, you know, the hammer's going to fall. It could be one of many things. But this is going to go, in the end, this is going to turn out for the good for our country, for us. But we have to do our part. And that part, you know, we have uh, the ballot, the ballot box. We don't have bullets. We have the ballot. And uh, if we, the only way we're going to get, we the people are going to get our power back, is that we have to act together and do something that's so decisive, so um, powerful, that we shake it up and shake up the, the whole political system of the, the one-party system. And to do that, we have to take on one political party. We have to make an example of one political party that we have the power collectively to shut them down, to essentially eviscerate their power. And that is by using the ballot box. We can do that. But which party is it going to be? You could say both have their problems. Well, let's look at which party is causing the problems for the cultures of America. Which party mismanaged COVID? Which one told us to stay home rather than going to work? Which one told us that all this uh, gender dysphoria is a natural thing? And we have to let kids uh, below a, the age of 18 to make decisions, permanent decisions about their health. 
which one's freaking out over the reversal of Roe versus Wade, even though it's in the States? Which one is in favor of high taxes, even though we know that the way to get new revenue or, or grow revenue for the federal government is to lower taxes? So what are they trying to do? Which party or uh, has had control when um, the bureaucracy has been used against conservatives? Going back to the Tea Party times when I was involved with that, the IRS was going after Tea Party people under the Obama administration. Quite frankly, I think a lot of this that we're seeing, and I can go on and on about these abuses of power, and that sort of really formed the basis of why I wrote this book. But the bottom line is that it's the Democrat Party. And the Democrat Party that talks about democracy, at the same time, they're dictators. I call them democratic dictators. And you can have a dictatorship under a democracy. We saw what happened to, to Hitler. He was elected originally by democracy, as a democracy, even though the Nazis, the National Social Socialism Party, the uh, it happens. But the bottom line is that they are dictators, and they dictate our lives. And this is where might becomes right, and we're in bondage. So we have to throw it off. We have to throw off the, the controls, the powers of the Democrat Party. And we can do that through a boycott, national boycott of Democrats. We saw what happened whenever the uh, Bud Light thing went too far. They've lost what, what, almost $20 billion that they'll never get back in, in market share. Look at Target. They've lost 13 or $14 billion. There are other stores that have lost it. There's others that are involved with that. Uh, pushing this pride stuff. And of course, we know that most Americans think it's ridiculous to give any group a whole month's worth of uh, a specialty who really uh, as brings a lot of it on themselves, uh, as opposed to, say, Black History Month, which was something that brought upon those people long before and on their ancestors. But a whole month worth, we can thank Bill Clinton for that. And we all know he was a serial rapist and the Department of uh, Justice let him go. Uh, he lied uh, under oath. Should have been enough for it to take him out. So that here's this. Here's what we are. We are living in a democratic dictatorship. Like it or not, that's what we're dealing with. And we have to take control. And we can do that by totally boycotting the Democrat Party. Well, some may say, well, Republicans aren't going to vote for Democrats anyhow. Well, there's a lot of Republicans, you know, rhinos that will. What we have to go is to talk to the independents because the independents make the difference between winning and losing. And in the 2024 presidential election, it's going to come down to just a few states by as little as 10 or 20,000 votes per state. And now that's assuming that they're going to be, you know, the, the elections are going to be fair because we know that there was a lot of interference. And as time goes on, we see everything from the, the, the uh, Mark Zuckerberg sending $400 million to the, uh, governments and, and uh, different states to um, get out the vote, basically. And we know that Joe Biden has uh, weaponized the bureaucracy to get out the vote, even though they're not supposed to. But in spite of all those things, we need to just tell the Democrat Party, we're done with you. And we do that by total boycott from top to bottom, from dog catcher to POTUS, president of the United States. Do that a few election times, and you're going to see them change their tune real fast. And we're going to get our power back. At that time, then we turn to the rhinos. We say, look, you're next. Clean it up. And then we have our power back. And then right becomes might again, and we're free. That's the only alternative I see after having witnessed these things for nearly 40 years. I've come to the conclusion that it's not you know, righteous indignation or, or anger or anything like that. It's just slow and, and deliberate and long, thought-out reasoning. This is the plan that's been laid for us by our founding fathers. We need to follow through with it. And we can't afford to let our country down. It's about our children, our grandchildren, and their grandchildren. If this uh, great experiment in self-governance is, is to go on for another 235 years or whatever, it's our duty. The generation before us, their duty was to fight and win World War II. It's a duty now of my generation, the baby boomers, and even the past generations here that would follow us. We have to right this ship. 
And this is how we do it. Spread the word far and wide. The only way we're going to stop this is to boycott the Democrat Party. And uh, I think if we all get together, we the people get together, we can preserve our nation and preserve our way of life. Well, I always enjoy talking to you. I understand we have some people out uh, in the Yosemite area. Of, I believe that's California who are going to be listening to me here on Sundays. And I uh, look forward to getting responses. You can always go to my website, drbillchobybooks.com, and there you can leave a comment there. Uh, certainly, I'd like for you to go and buy a book and use that and spread it, to, uh, spread it around to your friends. The whole thing was intended to give you a sort of a, a soup to nuts kind of a, a primer uh, on what it is to be an American. We need to regain that. So, Dr. Bill Choby here. Remember, when might is right, we live in bondage. When right becomes might, we live in freedom. When right becomes wrong, we live in chaos. Until either might or right becomes dominant again, the choice is ours. The responsibility is ours. And I know we can go pick up the mantle and correct and right this ship. Thanks so much for checking in. I said I always enjoy talking to you. All right, goodbye for now. Thank you.